If you watched our first ride review of the new Himalayan 450, you'll know that the bike was super capable up in the mountains. Great fun on the good roads and so, so talented in the off-road sections. I really enjoyed riding this bike up there and at one point I even said there's something romantic about riding a bike called the Himalayan in the Himalayas. The thing is though, rides up in the Himalayas are very rare occurrences and there is nothing romantic about returning back to life in the big city. I have been living with this motorcycle in Mumbai for the past 2-3 weeks now and the whole point of today's video is to address some of the questions that we couldn't answer in the first ride review and also share some new discoveries that I've made along the way. Now one of the first things I'd like to start with is addressing one of my biggest concerns from the first ride review and that's the low RPM performance. If you recall, I said that this new Sherpa 450 engine felt completely flat below 3000 RPM. There just wasn't any performance at that rev range. Now, it wouldn't stall on you, but you'd have to wait for the needle to cross the 3000 RPM mark. A lot of that was down to altitude as it turns out, because in the city, the bike feels a lot better. In the mountains, I really noticed it. Over here, not so much. The only time you really notice it is when you're riding in slow moving traffic, you spot a gap and you want to go for it, but you have to wait for a second for the revs to pick up. Otherwise, in most circumstances, this is actually a really nice bike to ride in traffic. The engine is tractable. I spend very little time in first gear. Second is good for most applications. It's not as low and tractable as the old Himalayan engine, but it makes up for it whenever you cross the 3000 RPM mark. Overall, it's actually a really nice engine to use in traffic. The clutch feel is good and it doesn't get too hot. There was a concern about where the hot air blast from the radiator fan would go, but it doesn't really hit you. If you get stuck in bad traffic, you will feel some warmth along the right side of your body, but it's really not bad. It's not heat, it's warmth. Now, one of the things that actually surprised me when we got the bike back down to sea level was the performance. When we tested this bike, it gave us a 0 to 100 time of 6.3 seconds, which was quicker than I was assuming. In fact, that's actually quicker than both the new Triumphs, not just the Scrambler, but also the lighter Speed 400. And that time is quite close to the KTM 390 Adventure. Roll-on performance is also very good. And I think the reason this motorcycle is quicker than the Triumphs in our acceleration tests, even though it's heavier and it makes the same 40 horsepower, is the way the power is delivered. The Triumph engines don't really like being revved out. There's more vibration up there. There's not a lot of reward for doing that. But the Himalayan does reward you. You can take it all the way to 8,500 RPM. There's a great induction noise. It sounds good. It eggs you on. And there's genuine performance up there. Surprisingly, this is not just a tractable mule of a motorcycle. There is fun to be had when you rev it out. Now, the important thing to consider is that our fuel efficiency tests are conducted at fairly conservative real-world but conservative speeds. For example, our highway tests are done at about 80 to 85 kph so that we're staying within the national speed limit. If you go faster, you will surely get a smaller fuel efficiency figure. But overall, it's not bad and with a 17-litre fuel tank, this thing can easily do 350 kilometers on a tank full. I've actually grown quite fond of using this engine for regular daily use. It's nice if you want to chill, it's good fun if you want to go fast, it basically gives you anything you ask of it in almost any situation. There is only one thing that I find slightly disappointing after riding it in the mountains. Now up there I did say there are some vibrations but they didn't really bother me. The thing is, up there we were riding in very padded winter clothing and we were not holding sustained high speeds. Over here, I found that there is a clear vibration that creeps in between 5000 and 5800 RPM. It builds up in the bars, it builds up in the foot pegs, and you do feel it. Now that speed in 6th gear is about 105 to 120 km per hour. The bike is smooth up to 100 and it smooths out again above 120. But that crucial cruising speed window does come with some vibrations that you'll feel here and here. They're not a deal breaker, but I haven't been able to ignore them either. And I wish Royal Enfield was able to isolate that rev range a little bit better. Because it is funny that this motorcycle is smoother at 130 than it is at 110. 
Nevertheless, actual cruising performance is really good. It is rock solid, even above 125. You can hold 130 if you wish to. Wind protection is also quite nice. It's a nice balance between keeping the blast off you, but also not keeping you completely isolated from the wind. You do get some cooling breeze, but not too much buffeting, and I really like it. That highway cruising capability goes very nicely with this bike's riding position. This is really neutral, very spacious, all day comfortable and I like riding it in traffic as well. The handlebar is not too wide but you do sit high up and you have a great commanding view. Now, the elephant in the room with this motorcycle is that it is a big machine. It's big feeling, it feels tall and the biggest challenge for most people is just simply getting it off the side stand. But what is nice is that once you're moving, the handlebar feels a lot lighter than you would expect. And that means that it doesn't take much effort to navigate between tight gaps in slow-moving traffic. I think that as long as you're comfortable with putting your feet down, you should be fine with riding this bike in traffic and I have never found it too large or cumbersome. That being said, this is undoubtedly a large and fairly tall motorcycle. And if you're a short rider, you need to check that you're comfortable with getting your feet down. There is also the temptation to consider the lower seat that Royal Enfield will sell you, which brings the seat height down to about 805 mm. That does sound good, but Ari has achieved that by reducing the cushioning on the seat, which will surely have some impact on the comfort. We haven't tried that accessory seat out, but it's something to consider. As for the stock seat, I think it's really quite comfortable. I would like to try the touring seat, but I'd be happy to live with this if I needed to. My favorite aspect of commuting on this motorcycle though is that rock solid, unshakable feel that it gives you. I have a 33 km commute to work and I have some great roads and some terrible ones. On most motorcycles, it usually takes me 50 to 55 minutes in the morning, but the Himalayan has cut that time down to about 45 minutes. The speeds I achieve are more or less the same. The difference is I just don't have to slow down anymore. If I need to slow down, I know the brakes have enough performance to keep me safe. If I hit a big bump, I know the suspension in the chassis can take it. And that fills you with confidence so you can keep your speed up, get through anything that comes your way and do so in complete comfort. Now let's talk about the smaller details that have stood out with day-to-day -day use. For one, this TFT display is superb. Very simple layout but very easy to read and gives you all the information you need. This is one of my favourite TFT displays on pretty much any motorcycle out there. I think Ari has done a great job with this. What I don't like is this joystick button down here that you use to control the display. It feels fiddly, it's not very precise and that needs to be improved. The rest of the switch gear is okay but this is an annoyance. And while I'm talking about annoyances, Royal Enfield has now moved to these rotary switches which are very nice. It's on all their motorcycles now. But there's no conventional high beam flat switch. If you want to do that, you've got to do this, which is not a very easy move and it's definitely not one that comes quickly when you need to flash somebody in a hurry. Another small couple of things that I've grown to appreciate are that the mirrors are really quite nice. They look simple but they give you a great field of view and somehow at night you don't get bedazzled by high beam traffic behind you. I don't know what they're doing but there's not too much glare that comes back at you. And that's a nice thing. Then there's the fuel gauge which has proven to be quite reliable and consistent and I think it works better than what we've seen in the 350s and the 650s where sometimes the fuel level dramatically drops when you're approaching the reserve level. Finally, there are the modes. Now Royal Enfield gives you four modes. There's performance with ABS on at the rear, performance with ABS off, eco with ABS on and eco with ABS off. Eco mode cuts performance by about 20% in the first four gears and then gives you full performance in fifth and sixth. I have never used it, I don't feel any need to use it because the throttle response is very nice. Like I said, the low RPM performance is not strong or startling. I've never used Eco and I don't think I ever will unless I'm in a situation where I'm running out of fuel. What is annoying though is that sometimes the modes don't want to change when you're on the move and you get a message that says try on the next ignition cycle. You turn the key off, you turn it back on, it seems to work. I think it's a niggle, it's something Royal Enfield needs to sort out but it reduces the amount of times I try turning off the ABS at the rear because you have to come to a stop and you have to do it then. I wish Royal Enfield would do what KTM is doing with the new 250 and the 390 Duke. You turn it off and the bike remembers it, it never switches it back on even if you completely turn the ignition off. Another couple of things I've noticed are that the headlamp is all right. It's really not bad, but it's not fantastic either. If I did a lot of touring at night, I'd probably look into some auxiliary lights. For regular use, it's fine, but not fantastic. 
There are some smaller attention to detail bits that I really like. We've showed you how the seat adjusts in the first ride review. That is very nice, very convenient to do. You can raise it by 20 mm. And I also like what Royal Enfield has done with the toolkit. It's nicely recessed out here. And when you open it up, you'll see that there's a really sensible amount of tools in there. They've thought about giving you tools for pretty much every scenario. Nicely put together, good tool set. And that's nice attention to detail. A couple of other observations, when we rode the bike in the mountains, this said max load 5 kgs, they've now increased it to 7 kilos. But this is a really solid feeling thing, I am sure this bike could take more, don't quote me on it, but I would put more luggage on there if I was touring with this motorcycle. Speaking of luggage, there's a lot of mounting points at the rear, at the front, very versatile, you could really stick a lot of luggage on this motorcycle. One more small ownership thing that has bugged me a little bit is that these little recesses on the engine cases, tend to hold water when someone washes the bike and if the water is not removed, it leaves hard water stains in there. This is something we've seen on other Royal Enfields, other motorcycles as well. Small thing and I'd love to have some sort of a drainage system out there which removes the water so that I don't have to look at that when I own the bike. Beyond that, I really don't have many complaints with this motorcycle. I think the kit levels are quite well judged. It has what I want. It doesn't have traction control. I don't want that in a motorcycle with this power level. It has ABS. You can switch it off at the rear. I am happy with the feature set on offer. I suppose the only things I really want were a quick shifter. That would be nice. And maybe cruise control for those who like to go touring. This bike has ride-by-wire throttle. So Royal Enfield could bring those things in as a future update. But as an overall package, I think it's very well equipped. And all the models have the same equipment. The only difference in terms of prices is the colors. Of course, the big deal is that those tubeless rims are still not available. Royal Enfield says they're working on it. They hope to have them available in a few months' time. I hope they do come soon and I hope they aren't too expensive. Before we get to the conclusion aspect of today's video, let's address the potential rivals to this motorcycle. You've got the KTM 390 Adventure in various variants, you've got the BMW G310 GS and there's the new Triumph Scrambler 400X. Now when it comes to a Pukka adventure bike in terms of something that can do great long distance touring at good speeds, keep you in very good comfort and handle off-road sections really well, put a big smile on your face, this bike takes the lead. If you want something smaller and lighter for the city, the Triumph is good. If you want great badge value and image, the BMW is nice. And if you want something a little more road biased, a little more sporty and aggressive, the KTM is the way to go. But when it comes to an all-round, very well-rounded package as an adventure bike, the Himalayan 450 is a level above. A good way to sum up, I think, is to say that I'm still really impressed with the Royal Enfield Himalayan 450. That first ride event was designed to showcase the best qualities of this bike and it did a really good job at that. But even after a few weeks of living with this bike in the grind of daily Mumbai traffic and a few highway rides, I am still very fond of this motorcycle and there is a lot to like about it. I think the one cautioning factor here, and I will stress on this again, is that this is a big motorcycle. I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing, it's not a negative, it's just a fact. This feels like a large full-size motorcycle and there are many positives to that thing. But if you're a smaller, shorter or maybe just a less experienced rider, that is something you need to keep in mind. Royal Enfield will surely be losing some customers who liked the old 411 Himalayan for its approachability, its lower seat height. But they will also surely be gaining many new customers who love the high levels of capability that this bike has to offer. And I suspect the incoming number of customers is going to be bigger than those who are going out.